And welcome to today's edition of Calc Chat. I'll be your host, Mr. Giordano. Uh, don't forget, if you like what you hear, don't forget to like and subscribe, click that follow button, and let's get on with the video. So I said, and I, I've talked about this, you know, last time as well, but we're going to have four theorems that we have to know. And we've said squeeze theorem, intermediate value theorem, extreme value theorem, and then the last one is today, the mean value theorem, okay? And as with any theorem, we always start with the conditions. These are the most important things about any theorem. What has to be true to use it? And so here's what has to be true <clears throat> to use the mean value theorem. Number one, we need a function to be continuous on a closed interval. All right, and that is how the intermediate value theorem started. That is how the extreme value theorem started. Um, pretty sure that's how the squeeze theorem started as well. It's all about continuity. But the second thing that has to be true is our function has to be differentiable on the open interval. Now, none of our other uh, theorems have needed our function to be differentiable. But what this means is we need our function not to not have any sharp turns um, and it can't have any vertical tangent lines. That's basically what we're talking about here. And we use the open interval because functions can't be differentiable at endpoints. Like a derivative is slope of a tangent line. And, you know, if I had some curve that's continuous on the closed interval and I wanted to draw a tangent line here at the end point, well, I don't know exactly, you know, could, is it there? Is it there? We don't know exactly what that looks like. So we always talk about differentiability on the open interval. But bottom line, we need a continuous and differentiable function, a nice smooth function. So I'm going to draw that over here. I'm going to draw some function that's just nice and smooth. I mean, you could straight up just connect from A to B, but I'm going to draw a nice different, ooh, what a beautiful differentiable function. Mm, beautiful. Okay, so if you have this, uh, these two conditions, continuous and differentiable, then here's what's true then there exists a number, we'll call that number C, in the open interval, very similar to the intermediate value theorem. There's going to be an x value in this interval such that oops, f prime of C equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And I'll give you a second to jot that down before I start talking because it's really important we understand, you know, that's a lot of notation there, but it's important that we understand what this is talking about. I would encourage you to try to think about what this is saying before I just say what it is. That's going to help you so much more. But... So far in this class, we've talked about two different types of rates of change. We've talked about instantaneous rate of change, and we've talked about average rate of change. This theorem connects those two ideas. This right here is average rate of change. This is basically saying if you would take the slope from one endpoint to the other, if you would find the average rate of change from A to B, if you would find the slope that connects A and B, this is saying there's going to be some x value in this interval. There's going to be some point on this function where the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. Or in other words, there's going to be some point where the tangent line, I'm just going to eyeball this right now, where the tangent line is parallel to the secant line. A secant line connects the endpoints. So that c value would be right here. Again, they are saying there is some point where the instantaneous rate of change or derivative is equal to the average rate of change over the interval. Just like the intermediate value theorem, this is known as an existence theorem. This is not going to find the value for you. It's just going to tell you it's going to happen. There's going to be a point where the derivative equals the average rate of change. So example one says, given this function on 2 to 6, find c such that f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Well, first, let's think about why there has to be a c value where this is going to happen. If I would graph this, 
If I would graph the square root of x minus 2, well, think about what this graph looks like. The square root function starts at the origin and goes off in this direction, and an inside chain shifts it to the right two units. So it's going to look something like this. It starts here, and it goes off in that direction. That's what the graph looks like, but we're only focused on from 2 to 6. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we're only focused on this particular interval. Well, there's going to be a C value where this happens because this function is continuous on the closed interval and it's differentiable on the open interval. It's nice and smooth. So here's what we have to do. All right, It doesn't matter the order in which you do this, but we have to find the average rate of change. We have to find that. And we have to find the derivative of this function. We have to find those two things, and it doesn't matter in what order you do that. I'm going to start by finding the average rate of change. So the average rate of change is equal to, and we're just finding y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We're finding f of 6 minus f of 2 over 6 minus 2. So I'm plugging those into the function, and I'm going to get 2 minus 0 over 4. So the average rate of change over that interval is 1 half. Now I want to find the derivative of this function. Well, this is where our derivative rules come into play. Right now, this is x minus 2 to the 1 half. And I want to find the derivative. So we have to do chain rule. 1 half comes out in front. Inside stays the same. Reduce your power by 1 times the derivative of the inside, which is just 1. So you could luck out and get the derivative right without doing chain rule. So this is the same as 1 over 2 square root of x minus 2. OK, so we found the average rate of change. We found the derivative. The mean value theorem says there's going to be some place where these two things are equal to each other. We have to find that x value. So basically, we're going to set our derivative equal to the average rate of change. We're going to set 1 half equal to the derivative. And now we have to solve this equation. Well, we have a proportion. So we're just going to cross multiply. So 2 equals 2 radical x minus 2. We can divide both sides by 2. We can square both sides to get rid of the radical. And x equals 3. That's our c value right there. So what that is saying, this is important for, for comprehension, that's saying that if I would find the average rate of change from 2 to 6 of this function, that slope right there, they're saying when x is 3, right here on this graph, right here, they're saying the slope at this point, if I would draw the tangent line, see how good of a job I did. If I would draw, no, that's terrible. But that's okay. If I would draw that tangent line, that's going to be the same as the slope of the average rate of change. Those are going to be parallel. That's the whole idea. That's the mean value theorem. <clears throat> All right, next one. So given this function on the interval, find C that satisfies the mean value theorem. We do the same thing. We find the average rate of change. We find the derivative. And then we set those equal to each other. That's the whole idea. So average rate of change is our slope formula. So if I plug in 1 and negative 1, I would get negative 2 minus 0 over 1 plus 1, which is negative 1. Just plug it in the endpoints and doing the slope formula. Then I'm going to find the derivative. I'm going to find you, derivative. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Right there. And I want to know where is this derivative equal to this average rate of change. So I set them equal to each other. Any quadratic ever, we need it to equal 0. So I'm going to add, before I solve, so I'm going to add 1 over. And 
And then we just have to have a way to solve this quadratic, whether you use quadratic formula, whether you use the AC method, whether you use, you know, slip, slide, divide, box method, whatever you use, I'm going to factor this through guess and check. I'm a guess and check fan sometimes if the numbers are small. So x would be negative one-third and positive one. Now, this isn't really going to come up a lot, but the conclusion of the mean value theorem says there's a number in the open interval, so not at endpoints. The conclusion is not talking about endpoints, which means this one right here, since it's at an endpoint, is actually not satisfying the conclusion of the theorem. So we're just going to include negative one-third. That's not something that's going to come up a ton, but it's worth mentioning. There's our mean value theorem. I think my chair just broke. What the heck? Okay. Next, example three. Write this down. This one's calculator active because, and beep, you can usually tell which problems you're going to need to use your calculator on based on how the answers look. Like when you get these nasty answers with all these decimals, that probably means you're going to have to use your calculator to solve. So this says, which value of x best approximates the value which satisfies the mean value theorem for this function on 1 to 8? We're going to do the same thing we did earlier. We're going to do our slope formula. We're going to find f of 8 and f of 1. But since it's calculator active, it will give you those values. So I'm just going to write those here. f of 8 is 5. f of 1 is 2. So our average rate of change is 5 minus 2 over 8 minus 1. So 3 sevenths. Then we're going to find the derivative of our function. And now I want to set my average rate of change equal to the instantaneous rate of change, the derivative. So 3 sevenths equals 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Now here is, this is important, since this is calculator active, <clears throat> this goes for free response questions, and this goes for multiple choice. If you're ever staring at an equation that you have to solve, and you have a calculator that's allowed, let the calculator solve the problem for you. You don't have to solve it by hand, and that's going to come into play. Like, if this is an FRQ, I just write the equation, and then I just write x equals and whatever the answer is. I find it from my calculator. Now, you could do one of two things. You could either graph y equals 3 sevenths and y equals this right side and just see where they cross or set your equation equal to 0, like subtract 3 sevenths and find your x-intercepts. But you have to know how to use your calculator to solve equations because you're going to get nasty equations. This one we could solve by hand, but you're going to get nasty equations that you're just not able to and you have to know how to use the calculator. So I would, me personally, I always set my equations equal to 0 graph it and find my x-intercepts, but you would get e to solve that equation. So that's the mean value theorem in general, but what I did, I wanted to find one, an FRQ type problem on where, you know, this stuff's going to come into play. So I have a free response question right here, and this was from 2018. Um, you know, and I, I think students struggle on free response questions because sometimes they're not practiced enough. I like to get free response problems rolled out as soon as I can, and that way, you know, we use them throughout the year. By the end of the year, they're not as daunting. Some teachers will not do free response problems until, like, review time in March, and then at that point, students get lost. So I like to roll these out and just show you some pieces of advice. So they give a table, and it says the height of a tree at time t is given by a twice differentiable function. Some students are like, what does this mean? twice differentiable. All they're telling you is there's no funny business going on. They're telling you that this is a nice, smooth, continuous function and there's nothing weird happening. So when you see that, this is a good thing because that means there's nothing tricky happening. It's nice and smooth. H of t is measured in meters. T is measured in years. Selected values of H of t are given in the table. Okay, so A says use the data in the table to estimate H prime of 6. Use the data to estimate h prime of 6. 
this is what was on the warm up when we had that table and we were trying to estimate acceleration from the velocity table. And all we had to do, you know, if we want to find h prime of 6, well, look, there is no 6. But my best estimation would be to find the average rate of change from 5 to 7. If I just find the slope between these two points, that's going to give me my best approximation for what the slope is at 6. Is it 100% accurate? No, but based on this data, that's our best estimation. It says using correct units, interpret the meaning of h prime of 6 in context of the problem. Okay, so first let's find h prime of 6. We're just going to do the slope from 5 to 7. So we're going to do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I would get in the habit of showing, I know you could do some mental math. I would get in the habit of showing your slope formula because sometimes the directions will say, like, show the computation that leads to your answer. They actually want to see you doing the slope formula. So 5 over 2. Now, if I'm talking about units, units hurt us quite a bit on the last test, but if I'm talking about units, well, h is in meters, which means h prime would be meters per year. If this had asked for h double prime, that would be like acceleration. That would be meters per year squared. So we do units the same as we do position, velocity, and acceleration. This is meters per year. Now, interpret. So I'm going to look at, I'm just going to put the answer up here. Look at my interpretation. So when you interpret a derivative, derivatives are all about at a certain time. So anytime you're interpreting a derivative, you have to say at this time. So at t equals six years, the height of the tree is increasing, that's because it's positive, five halves is positive, at a rate of five halves meter per year. So when you're interpreting, they are very, very picky on how they dole out points. They want to see all this information. At this time, what is the height doing? It's increasing at a rate of five halves meter per year. Then B, okay, so I'm just going to read B and then I'll show you my, my work. It says, explain why there must be at least one time on 2 to 10, so in this interval, such that h prime of t equals 2. This is how they're going to ask you mean value theorem questions. They're not saying find it. In fact, it'd be impossible to find. They're just saying, will it happen? Why must there be? When you see this question, this is either intermediate value theorem or mean value theorem. And the way you know it's mean value theorem is because it's talking about derivative. Intermediate value theorem was not about a derivative, but mean value theorem is. So this is a mean value theorem question. So I want you to look at how I worded this. So if you look at the average rate of change, this one's kind of tricky. If you look at the average rate of change from 2 to 10, like if you would find the slope from 2 to 10, if you did 15 minus 1.5 over 10 minus 2, that is not 2. That average rate of change is not 2. So at first glance, you're like, well, there isn't one because the average rate of change isn't 2. But if you look within the intervals, this is why it's kind of tricky. If you look right here from 3 to 5, if you would find the average rate of change from 3 to 5, so notice what I did, 6 minus 2 over 5 minus 3. The average rate of change from 3 to 5 is 2. So notice how I phrase this. I find that average rate of change, and anytime you're going to use a theorem, you have to state the conditions first. Since h is differentiable, which it tells me, it's also continuous. If a function's differentiable, it is continuous. These are the two conditions needed to use the mean value theorem. I state them. H is differentiable, which means it's continuous. So by the mean value theorem, there must be a t value on this interval from 3 to 5. There has to be some x value in this interval where the instantaneous rate of change is 2 because the average rate of change was 2. There has to be a t value on that interval where the derivative is 2. Well, if there has to be a value on this interval 
where the instantaneous rate, rate of change is 2, then there has to be a value on 2 to 10 because 3 to 5 is inside that interval. So since there has to be a value on 3 to 5 where h prime of t is 2, there has to be a t value on 2 to 10 where h prime of t is 2. So these explanation, you know, these problems where you're not like solving for something, these are tough problems because you have to say things very particular. Even if you understand, I, I, there's so many students that understand what's happening, but they don't know how to word it. And that's why I, you know, I like to show this FRQ practice and what is required when you're explaining or justifying or whatever the case may be. So there's your mean value theorem. I hope you have a wonderful day. You are awesome. Let's see if I can get this to actually stop recording. You can leave now unless you want to watch me mess around and try to get this exit. I don't know if I want to exit. I want to save this video. Um, maybe if I do a new screen recording. Oh.